So, um, as I said, we have Professor Yu Hao here, and uh, the other speaker is myself. Uh, so, Professor Yu Hao, um, he's, a, he's an assistant professor in the Institute of Interdisciplinary Information Sciences, uh, the IEEE-S in Tsinghua University. And before that, he was a postdoc in the statistical laboratory in the Department of Pure Mathematics and Mathematical Statistics at, at the University of Cambridge in the UK. And uh, before that, he got his PhD from the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at MIT. He was advised by Professor Caroline Erler. And prior to that, he was an undergraduate student in the Department of Automation in Tsinghua University. So I guess he, he completed the cycle from Tsinghua to MIT, Cambridge, and back to Tsinghua. So it's a pleasure to have him um, speak in our speaking in our meetup tonight. And with that, I would like to um, pass, pass, the, pass the word to Professor Yu Hao. Yep. Okay, many thanks for introduction. So now I'm going to share my screen. Uh, so can I, see, can I see my sharing? Uh, yes. Okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, let me open it. Yeah. Okay, can I, see, can I see the slides now? Yeah, we can see your slides. Okay, awesome, thank you. So, okay, so hello everyone, many thanks for introduction. Uh, in this talk, I'm going to talk about my research uh, in developing a new method called the uh, Debiased Inverse Probability Score Rating for the problem of estimation the every treatment effects with high dimensional confounder. So I'm Yu Hao, I'm currently an assistant professor in the Chipao Art of Tsinghua. So this is my joint work with Dr. Rajin Shah from the University of Cambridge. So he was my postdoc advisor when I was at the Cambridge. Uh, so before I talk about my research in detail, so let's uh, first start with the problem setup. So in this problem, we consider the settings that uh, we have collections of the NID samples, Xi, Yi, and Ti. So here the Xi correspond to, for example, the correct, correct features, or maybe the sample features you know, of, each, uh, of each, each individual I, for example, such as like uh, each individual's genders and uh, height and the body temperature or some, some, some other features. So TI is the treatment. So you can consider a kind of uh, setting such that, uh, for, for example, in the, uh, in the clinical trials or in some other settings where each, uh, each individual is received, uh, received, for example, a medical, medical treatment uh, or not. So here TI corresponds to the indicator of whether this individual has received the treatment or not. So in particular, if TI is equal to, uh, equal to one, it means that it has received the treatment. And uh, if it is equal to zero, it means that this individual does not use the treatment. And uh, so why is uh, actually the what I correspond to the res response of the individual individual I after receiving a TI, after receiving a treatment TI. So here TI could be either uh, equal to one or not. So it is uh, uh, a very classical setting in the causal inference where we have the correct features indicating the features of each uh, individuals and the treatment, uh, which is equal to either one or zero. And we also observe the response after receiving the, after receiving the treatment TI. And uh, in addition to this, to, to describe the causality, we consider the potential outcome framework where we assume that for each individual, uh, for each individual I, so uh, there exists some kind of, uh, for each individual I, there are, uh, so there are two, there, uh, each, this individual I uh, has uh, uh, two potential outcomes uh, that is corresponding to it. So here uh, the, uh, the potential outcomes uh, uh, are denoted as uh, Yi1 and Yi0. So here, y one and y, so here, y one or zero, we, we can call it y t, correspond to the potential response uh, of the individual uh, individual i after receiving the treatment t. This t could be either one or zero. So, so you can imagine that you know, for example, in a medical trial, this corresponds to the setting that the individual i. Uh, so, so y one corresponds to the setting that. Uh, the individual, the potential, the potential responses of the individual I, if this uh, uh, individual I had received a uh, uh, has, has received the drug, and uh, the Y zero, this Y zero corresponds to the potential response 
the potential response of the individual eye if uh, via zero corresponds to the potential response of the individual eye if uh, this individual eye do, did not assume this, uh, this medical treatment. So, uh, and because, you know, for each individual features, uh, we, so we assume that they have, they have already received the treatment uh, TI equal to zero or one. So, so, so Y is correspond to Y of TI, which means that uh, the real response of the, uh, the real response of the, uh, this individual I after, you know, received what he had received before. Yeah, any questions for the setup? Okay. Uh, I, have, I have a question. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so here, so the same uh, individual has to go through both the treatments? Uh, no, actually, the, so that's what, that's a very good question. So what's that, that's what I mean by potential response. You can imagine that this is uh, the potential response is me, me correspond to a, a virtual experiment. For example, what I want corresponds to, a, for example, the virtual, virtual experimentations that the individual eye could, has received uh, the treatment. And uh, YI0 is like the, the virtual you know, responses uh, after you know, this individual eye has did not receive the treatment. So they are all virtual. You can imagine that uh, this is like some, some kind of what if. What if language? This is what if you know this individual has received the treatment. What is your response? And uh, in real life, you know, in each individual I could either receive TI equal to one and zero, and their responses is actually the YI equal to Y of TI, which is uh, uh, so. This is the, the treatment this individual I has really received, and the YI is their uh, their real responses. So this is a virtual response, and this is a real response. So um, does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, <clears throat> thank you. Okay, yeah, okay, you're welcome. And uh, also, we you know, also we also assume the unconfounded unconfoundedness assumption, which is also a kind of uh, common assumption that is received that is assumed in the cost inference literature that uh, we assume that uh, the potential outcomes y i one and y i zero they are independent from the treatment assignment t i. Um, by conditioning on the uh, by conditioning on the covariate feature vector xi, so this is the unconfounded assumption. And uh, and also we in this problem we consider the high dimensional statistic settings uh, where we assume that the the number of the covariate features p, uh, which is the dimensions of the feature vector xi, it is much bigger than the number of samples I, uh, number of samples n. So this is the high dimensional assumption we assume. And after, um, based on these setups, our goal is to estimate the error treatment effect. Uh, our goal is to estimate the error treatment effect tau, which is defined as the expectations uh, of the differences between the, uh, which is the expectation of the differences of the potential outcomes y, y, y1 and the potential outcome y0. And moreover, we want the estimation accuracy rate of this uh, error treatment effect estimation is, uh, is at the one over squared n rate. So this is our goal we want to, assume, we want to achieve. And uh, so in order to achieve this goal, so one standard, one standard pro, um, method that has been proposed to achieve this goal is called augmented uh, inverse pro, inverse probability estimator. So basically, you know, uh, the basic setup of, the, of this estimator is that it first estimates two, uh, two models. Uh, they first estimate two models. The first model is um, it's called the probability score models, which is the, uh, which is the probability that uh, this, uh, uh, the TI is equal to one by conditioning on that uh, the feature vectors is equal to X. And the second model is called uh, the outcome regression models which is the conditional expectation of the potential outcomes of YIT um, by conditioning on the, by, by given that uh, the individual feature XI is equal to X. So this is uh, the two models. Uh, uh, and uh, so what the augmented inverse permissive weighting estimator do is that the first estimate the pi, which is uh, first estimate the pi and Y and RT. Uh, first estimate these two functions. And here we use uh, the pi hat and uh, also the and also the 
R hat one to denote, for example, the estimate of the two functions. And then it uh, um, take these two functions as a plug-in to an estimator, uh, to, as a, the, and they takes the estimate of these functions as a, a plug-in of, uh, <coughs> uh, of uh, a bunch of samples, uh, uh, as a plug-in of, uh, for example, a bunch of samples, and uh, then add them together. So this is how the, uh, and uh, this is how the augmented inverse permissivating uh, estimator is doing. And uh, how the augmented inverse permissivator is doing. By assuming that, uh, for example, in the high dimensional settings, uh, the RT is a high dimensional linear regression models, and the pi is the, so here we call that the, the, the R and the, so R and the, you know, pi, they correspond to the optimal regression models and uh, the, the permissive models. So by, by now, by assuming that the RT is a high dimensional, uh, the response model is a high dimensional regression model. And by also assuming that uh, the permissive models is a high dimensional logistic models. Uh, then by using the standard results in, for example, the high dimensional, in the high dimensional literature, we can obtain that uh, the augmented inverse permissivating estimator is uh, square root n consistent, which means that it, con it converges to the ground truth in the one over square root n rate. Uh, if we have that the sparsities of the outcome regression models and uh, the, and, uh, the logistic model for, uh, have the following constraint, have the following constraint, okay, have the following constraint, that uh, if we assume that, for example, sparsity is of the number of non-zero entries in the outcome regression models and the logistic models uh, are both of order square root n over log p, then we can prove that uh, augmented inverse permissivating estimator is actually square root n consistent. So, so one take home message is that, uh, uh, so what are augment, a very strong requirement for the augmented uh, inverse permissivating estimator to be squared and consistent is that it uh, first need to, uh, first you know, we the specific, need to the specifications of the outcome regression models and uh, the logistic model need to, need to be correctly specified. And uh, then the augmented inverse permissivating estimator, you know, uh, estimated this to uh, to models and then as a plugin uh, to some samples to get uh, the correct uh, estimation of the arbitrary effect. So in addition to the augmented inverse permissivating estimator, so there are also other works that can estimate the error treatment effect in the one over square root n rate. Uh, in, for example, one over square root n rate, when both the outcome regression models and the performance models are uh, guaranteed to be correctly specified, or that they can be uh, a consistent estimated at a slower rate such as uh, the one from Chernobyl Zhukov uh, and also the one from Ferro and many other papers. So as we can see that uh, a common feature is that they all require that uh, we have some kind of pre-specification of the outcome regression models and the models that uh, need to be correct, uh, that need to be correct. And then they can estimate the error treatment effect uh, at, the, at the one over the square root n rate. So this is uh, a common feature for all, all of this method. So in this work, uh, so in this work, we are primarily interested in the question of the of the estimation of average chunking effect when there are model misspecification or that uh, the models are misspecified. In particular, in particular, in this work, we are primarily interested in the broad question of the estimating the error treatment effects uh, when, for example, the high dimensional outcome regression models, uh, all of the propensity models are actually misspecified. Actually misspecified. So, and, uh, so in, in addition to my work, there are also some other works that uh, try to understand you know, how to estimate error treatment effect when there is model misspecifications. So, so in summary, they can be uh, mainly classified into two categories. The first is the mild, mis mild misspecifications that has been studied by Ning Yang and Zhi Qiantan. And there is also complete misspecification that has been studied by, by Susan Essay. So let me first introduce the mild misspecification. <coughs> Uh, so basically, they, their method is very similar to the augmented inverse permissivating estimator. 
uh, except that uh, for their estimator, they allow either the outcome regression models or the probability model to be, for example, misspecified, but uh, but not but they, they they cannot allow both of them, them to be to be misspecified. Moreover, you know, uh, the method does not know that which of the which of the two models. Uh, so which of, does not need to know which of the which one is misspecified is and which is not misspecified. Uh, in addition to this, they also require that for the model that has been misspecified, uh, its the best linear or logistic model approximation is actually a sparse model. It's actually a sparse model. So this is why I say that mild misspecification. Um, because uh, although it requires one of the models to be to be, to be specified, but uh, they still, uh, still require them to be approximated by some sparse model. So it means that they still have some uh, um, assumptions on the model that has been has been misspecified. So this is uh, the research on the bound misspecification. Another research is uh, the complete misspecifications. For example, in a paper by Susan Anthony, uh, they allow them. So in that paper, they allow the performance models to be completely misspecified, or if they can be arbitrarily complex. For example, uh, for example, the so for example, the in their paper, they can allow the uh, the performance models can be a dense logistic model, or even can be a dense dense non-parametric models. For uh, they do not uh, allow any kind of sparsities on the performance models, and it does not allow any kind of parametric assumptions on the provision models. On the provision models. Uh, so, however, they still require that uh, uh, the outcome regressions on, uh, they still require the outcome regression models to be a, a sparse model. For example, they require the outcome regression models, uh, the sparsities of the outcome regression models to be of order square root n over log p. Uh, to achieve the square root consistency. If they do not have this assumption, then this method cannot be uh, consistent anymore. As a, sum a summary, uh, in the, the current state of state of the art research in the complete, complete misspecifications uh, can allow you know, the provisional models uh, to be completely misspecified. However, when the uh, uh, provisional model to be completely misspecified, However, when the outcome regression models is uh, is uh, completely misspecified, there are still no research to there are still no research to understand uh, what would happen or how could we estimate the uh, error treatment effect in the one over square root n rate. This is also uh, the so this one is also the main research I have been the main question I've been trying to solve in this research. So, so, so far we, we are done with the uh, background introductions. So, so as a summary, so in the, uh, in the work, we have proposed a new score estimator without uh, doing, without assuming assumptions on the uh, outcome regression models RT. For example, the RTs can be a dense linear models or, or maybe, or it can be actually, actually complex. complex. So as a, as a computation of this, uh, we require the provincial models to be the sparse states of the provincial models to be of order square root n over log p, which is also by, for example, all the research I have been mentioned I have mentioned before. Uh, in addition, because we do not assume any sense on the uh, do not assume any sense on the outcome regression models, so. It, uh, and as a, a advantage of this uh, uh, of this assumption that the, the our model can be extended into as arbitrary functionals of the y1 or y0. For example, we can use this to estimate the variances of y1 and y0. Uh, in addition to this, we also provide a, a valid confidence, confidence interval of the proposed method. So before uh, now, I'm uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the details of my method. Uh, so so before I talk about uh, details, let me first introduce the inverse propensity score weighting estimator, which is the method, uh, which is the estimator that has motivated motivated by our that has motivated our estimator. 
the formal definition of the inverse continuity weighting estimator is called uh, is given here. It's given here. So as we can see, the formulations of the inverse continuity weighting estimator uh, it requires uh, the input requires, for example, the uh, the estimated property 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 score models, but uh, it does not require estimating the uh, outcome regression models. Uh, uh, Outcome regression models RT, which is uh, very similar to our goal, which is very similar to our goal. However, you know the however a problem of the inverse continuity score weighting estimator is that the vastness of the uh, is that the vastness of the inverse continuity score weighting estimator is usually much larger than the one over square root n. You know, much larger uh, uh, for you know if we set the uh, the square state to be order uh, square root n square square root n, root n over log p. So so which is uh, also the main challenge we need to solve. That's why that's also the reason why we call our method as the debars the inverse propensity score weighting estimator because uh, because the main problem of the inverse uh, propensity score weighting estimator is that the vastness is too, is much larger than the one over square root n. Uh, it's much larger than the band over square ten, and uh, and now and because of this, uh, the band challenge to you know uh, adapt you know the inverse continuity score weighting estimator into the one over square root n consistency is to do the debarrassing. So this is why we call it the debarrassed inverse continuity score weighting estimator. So so as we can, the definition of our estimator is given below. As we can see that. Uh, Compared to the uh, inverse growing score weighting estimator, the main difference is, is that we have introduced a new term called mu i. And uh, we introduced this new, uh, this new term mu i from i equal to 1 to n in order to reduce the biasness, uh, reduce the biasness of the original uh, inverse growing score weighting estimator. Okay, now in the following slides, I'm going to provide a step-by-step -step analysis to intuitively explain how we can choose the mu, uh, mu to perform debarrassing. Now, assuming that you know the mu is generated uh, from a kind of random process, such that uh, uh, the the mu and the ts they are they are independent from each other. They are independent from each other by given the correct vectors xi. Then by using these uh, assumptions, we can see that the biasness of the DIPW estimator can it can be upper bounded by the following quantity. The following quantity can be the biasness uh, can be controlled by the following quantity, which is uh, uh, the following quantity, which is the uh, uh, which is norm of the estimation errors. So this corresponds to the error norm of the estimation errors of the logistic regression logistic regression models and uh, uh, of the estimation errors of the logistic regression coefficients. Uh, so which is usually of order s pi times the square root n over log p, so square root log p or n. And uh, so and uh, also we multiply this error. Uh, error norm with another uh, with another term, which is the error infinity norm of the x transpose times y tilde minus the x transpose times mu. So here the y tilde is uh, defined as uh, the following. You do not need to basically you do not need to understand that you know what it well, uh, do not need to remember the explicit form of this uh, of the y tilde. You just need to know that this is a function of t i y i and the pi hat estimated pi hat i. No, no, because it is a because it is a multiplication of the error infinity norm between x transpose by tilde minus x transpose mu uh, times the error norm of y hat gamma hat minus gamma. Now, if we can choose mu such that the error infinity norm error infinity norm of the differences is of order square root of, square root of log p or n, if we can choose mu that can satisfy this requirement. Then we can see that the a will become uh, the 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 scale of a will become s pi times log p or n, which is of order uh, which is of order one over square root n. 
which is uh, of small order of one square to n, if we assume that uh, s pi is of order square to n over log p. So, so then this can this means that we can solve the brightness of the because this means that we can solve the brightness uh in the term a because the variance is of order uh because you know because the variance is of order the one over n. So if, if we can if we can control the brightness to be small order of one over square to n, so then we can just uh, we can we can make the brightness to be much smaller than the variances. And uh, and we can solve this question. Now our problem become now our problem becomes that uh, uh, we want to control the we want to choose mu such that the R infinite norm of this to be of order square to, square root of log p over n. But uh, however, if we choose mu by directly controlling the x transpose by tilde minus the, the by directly controlling this term to be of order square to square root of log p over n, then the, the requirement that uh, uh, then the requirement that the the ti and mu s they are they are independent from each other this cannot be satisfied any, anymore because when we are estimating the mu s we are already using the the ti s and the y s that um, by the y y tells us so so this means that we, we cannot uh, directly controlling we cannot directly control this quantity. And in order to fix this issue, we in order to fix this issue, we introduce some some auxiliary samples, which is uh, exactly uh, from the same distribution as the the main samples. And then we and then we seek the mu that uh, that can satisfy the following constraint. Uh, so here, as we can say that the this constraint, the new constraint, is uh, exactly the same as this, except that we have replaced the x transpose times y tilde. With x uh, a transpose times y tilde a, uh, and uh, if we can choose mu that can satisfy this constraint, uh, so this uh, this can allow mu to uh, satisfy you know the so the the equality a, you know, the constraint in one um, by by further using the subcaution entities of the the x i and the y. And y and the yt, which is uh, commonly assumed in the high dimensional statistic statistic literature, uh, um, while well, we can still, um, but uh, and uh, at the same time we can still maintain that uh, the ti and the mu s they are conditionally conditionally independent from each other because uh, if we choose mu that can satisfy this constraint uh, in the data generating process we are not using the yi and the ti's in the data generating process. So, so the mu s will be independent from the TIs, and uh, and at the same time, at the same time, you know, we can still satisfy this constraint because the R infinite norm between this and this is a uh, of order uh, square root of log p or n. Uh, and also, notice uh, notice the in particular that uh, uh, in particular that in, in the entire you know in the in the in the entire generating process, uh, you know, finding the mu that can satisfy this constraint does not require, for example, the outcome regression models uh, yt to be estimable. This means that uh, uh, this means that uh, the the, the DIPW estimator can reduce the brightness of the original estimator to be of order one over square root n, small order of one over square root n, without without imposing any assumptions. Uh, any assumptions on the, for example, on the complexity of the outcome regression models RT. So I mean, uh, this is uh, this is how we can control, for example, the brightness without you know estimating the RTs or without having any assumptions on the RTs. So far, we have introduced a new method. We have shown that uh, the DIPW mass estimator can be used to uh, to reduce the brightness. Now we now we focus on the variances part, variance component. Uh, because uh, because you know, it, but just by looking at, at this uh, uh, this constraint, we can see that there are many mills. There are many mills that can satisfy this R infinity constraint. And now the problem becomes uh, we want to now the problem you know, now in order to control the variances, we want to choose mill uh, such that uh, uh, it can reduce the asymptotic variances of the 
propose the DRPW estimator. A very naive way to choose the mu that can that can satisfy this constraint while uh, and, and at the same time constraining the variances is, uh, is to uh, is to propose mu by minimizing the r infinite norm of the mu's, and uh, it is uh, so this corresponds to the following um, program where we minimize the r two norm of the mu's uh, under the constraint that uh, this uh, uh, so the the constraint here is satisfied by choosing eta to be of order uh, square root of log p or n. And it can be proven that uh, the, the variances of the tau hat uh, DIPW estimator is of order one over one over n by using the output from two. Uh, this is also the, the ideal order we want to assume because, uh, because this means that uh, the entire uh, error term is of order one over square root n, which is also the optimal, uh, optimal you know, error term we can achieve. Now, now we, now we to further get the asymptotic, asymptotic variances to be smaller than the than the one from two, we can change, we can further change the quadratic program as the following. So here, the f tilde is an approximation of the expectation of the y tilde by conditioning on the uh, condition on the feature correct feature vector x, and uh, and uh, which is constructed from some kind of auxiliary samples. Uh, from some auxiliary samples. Uh, Notice, uh, notice in particular that the primary goal of introducing F tilde is to uh, further uh, reduce the variances of the uh, the DIPW estimator by a constant scaling, which means that uh, uh, which means that uh, we do not need to uh, give any assumptions on the F tilde. For example, you know F tilde does not need does not need to consistently estimate uh, uh, the expectation of Y tilde given X. You know, for example, to achieve the square root consistency. For example, one can simply set uh, f tilde to be equal to v always equal to zero, which is uh, exactly the same as the estimator before. And uh, we can still achieve the uh, we can still achieve the one over square root n error rate. Error rate. Uh, at the same time, the we can also prove that uh, the asymptotic variances of the DIPW estimator will become smaller as uh, the F tilde get closer to the expectation of Y tilde condition on the X. So, so far we have introduced, uh, so far we have introduced the uh, uh, estimator and we show that how to control the variances and the biasness to aggregate all the previous results together we have the following uh, theoretical statement that under standard regularity conditions and assume that the, the permissive models follow a sparse logistic model with S pi to be of order square root n over log p. Then we have then we have that by choosing the eta to be of order square root of log p over n, and then it holds that uh, then holds that uh, the estimation errors of the DIPW follows the following bias on the variance of decomposition's. We are the we are with probability converging to one, the delta is of small order one over square root n. And in addition to this, by conditioning on the auxiliary samples and uh, the and also the, the ground truth uh, and also the correct vectors, uh, the eta is the uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, it follows a standard normal distribution. This means that uh, the proposed DRPW estimator is not a uh, it's not a asymptotically normal distribution, but it is asymptotically a mixture of normal distributions. And uh, yeah, uh, some remarks is that uh, so so in, so so because uh, as we can see that uh, in the previous method, in the previous instruction, we have we see that our method relies on some kind of auxiliary samples. However, in, in practice, we can split the entire sample into the main sample. Uh, we can uh, into sp split the entire sample into the main samples and the, the auxiliary samples and do cross-fitting. 
So this can, can solve the problem of introducing the uh, arbitrary samples. Uh, let's say this can solve the problem of introducing the auxiliary uh, samples. Uh, in addition to this, uh, uh, in order to estimate, uh, uh, in order to estimate, for example, some arbitrary functionals of the potential outcomes, such as the uh, expectation of f of y t. So here, uh, f is uh, kind of some kind of arbitrary functions. One can simply set uh, all the y's to be equal to y's the uh, uh, y's to be equal to f of y. You know, for the for the for the individuals that has uh, received the treatment t, and uh, then set the uh, other all the other samples to be equal to zero. And then we can and then we estimate the DRP W the is uh, then we we can apply the uh, DRPW estimator on the unit has you know this can be used to estimate arbitrary functionals. No, notice that because in the previous um, in the previous uh, slide we have mentioned that uh, DRPW can be can allow the RTs to be arbitrarily complex. And because of these special properties, uh, we can uh, the, we can use this uh, to estimate arbitrary functionals of YT. Now recall that uh, based on the based on the bias variance decompositions uh, that's shown here, the variance has two components: uh, the, the sigma bar on sigma bar and the sigma mu. So the sigma bar is the semi-parametric efficient variances, uh, which is uh, the variances that cannot be, this means that this corresponds to variances that cannot be reduced anymore. And uh, and uh, for the for the sigma mu that for the sigma mu that in the various variance variance conditions, it has the following two properties. The first uh, is that uh, the sigma mu can converge into zero as f tilde converge to the expectation conditional expectation of y tilde condition on the x. This is the uh, so this corresponds to the cost of not being able to consistently estimate the conditional expectation of y tilde given the given the x is equal to the quad vector uh, theta vector x. And uh, in addition to this, we can also prove that with probability conversion to one, uh, so with the probability conversion to one, the sigma sigma mu tilde sigma mu square is of order one. So this means that uh, so this means that although we have in order to control the variances, the variances, we have introduced some additional variance term. So, so but uh, but we can but DFW is still guaranteed to be a one over square root n rich because this additional variance term is uh, because we already you know sorry we already you know uh, multiply the square root n here. This means that the additional variances is uh, the additional variance term uh, is still of order uh, one over n. Okay, now we can, so far we have introduced the, the convergence rate of the estimator. Next, I'm going to talk about uh, how, uh, how the confidence, confidence interval so is constructed. So in order to uh, construct the confidence intervals, uh, we, introduced the, we introduced a new hat, which is like the, uh, which is the empirical variances of the, uh, the DIPW estimator. Uh, which is an estimate of the micro variances of the DFW estimator. Then we proposed to construct the confidence intervals uh, by the by the following property. The theorem, uh, uh, the theorem shows that under the same exactly the same assumptions as the theorem one, we have that uh, with we have that uh, with probability conversion to one. Uh, so the probability that uh, the the tau is equal to the c hat alpha is larger than one over alpha, which means that uh, it is a valid confidence interval. Okay, so sorry for the for the construction of c hat here. So the the z alpha uh, correspond to the the you know one minus alpha quantile minus uh, uh one minus one minus alpha over two quantile of you know of standard normal distribution. Or standard normal distribution, and uh, we have we have proven that this is a valid confidence interval.
in particular, so uh, I don't think in particular this theorem shows that uh, uh, so uh, so it shows that uh, actually that uh, uh, the for the for the term validity it means that uh, uh, this confidence interval is valid conditional on the d. So otherwise, with probability one, we can get, uh, for example, some kind of uh, some kind of d, which is uh, uh, a combination of the auxiliary samples uh, and uh, the correct vectors, such that the confidence is in intervals is valid by condition on the on the d. So otherwise, it means that we still there are still a very small probability that it converges that converge to zero. So this conf confidence confidence interval may not be valid. So we also perform some simulation studies to compare against the previous method. So this correspond this has both IPW and ARPW, uh, which is the standard method that has been proposed before. For comparisons, we also introduced TMRE, which is uh, developed by Mark Randerlin and Don Rubin in 2006, and also the AR uh, and also the ARB estimator that is uh, proposed by Susan SA. So for the target of interest, we consider the we consider the estimation. Uh, we consider the case. Uh, you know, we, we consider the performance of this method in estimating both the error shooting if at all, uh, and also the variances of the potential outcome by zero. Uh, so here we 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 here we use the for the data we use we for the correct vectors we use we we consider that. Consider the genetic data correct with dimensions p to be equal to four hundred. We also we also generate the treatment assignment t and the response function function y. You know by setting the probability model to be sparsely those probability models to be equal to five twenty and fifty, and uh, we set the outcome sparsely of the outcome regression models to be equal to fifty. The performance of the error treatment effect is given here. So basically, our method uh, can outcome outperform all the other methods uh, in terms of the, uh, by looking at the box plot. So this means that uh, so here this corresponds to the the result with gamma equal to five, twenty, and uh, fifty. So this means that our method is consistent better, even you know, even for the even when the progressive model is a very dense model. And also, we also have the result for the for the estimation errors of the the variances of the potential outcomes. So so what we can see is that is that all the methods tend to form, tend to perform similar uh, when the sparsity of the progressive model is equal to five. But uh, our method can be can better than the other method as the gamma gets denser. Another interesting phenomenon we have observed from the variance estimation part is that uh, in contrast to the average treatment effect estimation, uh, the TMLE has uh, surprisingly good performance for, for, for estimating the variances of Y1. Uh, but this is still not better than our method. Uh, so we also tried both simulations on the triplet de design and the expansion of decaying designs, and uh, the other results results are, are performed similar. In summary, we have proposed uh, the DIP data estimator that can estimate the tau in the one word squared n rate uh, with uh, the RT to be arbitrarily complex. In addition to this, uh, it is a RPW based estimator which uh, can perform debarsing by the projectic programming. We also extended this method into estimating arbitrary functionals, you know, uh, functionals. And if you need more details, you can see our archive. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Johal, for, for your very interesting talk. Um, I would mm -hmm. like to open, um, I would like to give the word to the audience if they have any questions. Uh, please un unmute yourself and uh, go ahead and ask you how directly. Uh, hi, uh, great talk, by the way. Uh, I actually yeah, have a okay. question. Um, so I'm currently working in propensity score matching as well, but I'm working mm. in the multiple treatment level scenario. So mm. how would you extend this to the multiple?